Welcome back to the Chaim Davies Show, and in today's episode, we're continuing our Pesach Exploration series, and what we just finished um, going through was the drasha, the exposition of Arami Oved Avi, where the Haggadah was involved in the really meat and potatoes of telling the story of the exodus of Egypt, as we expound on these verses from the book of Devarim, which as we explained, are the text that's recited at the time that the Jewish people bring their Bikurim offerings, their first fruit, when living in the land of Israel. So the idea of kind of mining that text for meaning, once we're already at the end of the journey, and looking back and, and seeing kind of where we came from, and all of the various details of the redemption process from exile, what it meant to be in exile, what motivated the Jews to cry out, what was the nature of that cry, what was the nature of God's response, how, did, how were we redeemed, what were the various components of that. All of that is the unpacking of the, uh, the Exodus experience, what it means to become free. And as we mentioned, there's a ton going on over there. We just kind of looked at it in broad strokes. Uh, but what it concluded on was a secondary interpretation of, of how God took us out, which in the second interpretation was a reference to the Ten Plagues. And what now the Haggadah moves on to is to a three-way debate between Rabbi Yossi Haglili, Rabbi Eliezer, and Rabbi Akiva as to the nature of these miracles which took place in Egypt as well as beyond. Because it turns out there's a discussion as to whether the ten plagues were the limits of God's mighty hand and outstretched arms, or were, were there even more things going on, perhaps behind the scenes, beyond the veil of the scripture, uh, which now we can come to understand by virtue of a, of a more critical analysis of the text itself. And so Rabbi Yossi Aglili says that although there were 10 plagues that occurred in Egypt, there were actually 50 plagues which took place at the splitting of the sea. Now Rabbi Eliezer argues on that and says that it goes even more than that because each one of the plagues was actually compounded as a series of a number of plagues happening concomitantly at the same time. So Rabbi Eliezer says that each of the 10 plagues in Egypt was actually comprised of four different elements. Whereas at the, at the splitting of the sea, those 50 that took place were also comprised of four elements each, which would equal a f- total of 40 makot, 40 plagues taking place in Egypt, and 200 taking place at the splitting of the sea. Rabbi Akiva argues and says that no, each maka, each plague is actually comprised of five components, yielding a total of 50 plagues in Egypt and a total of 250 at the sea. And so the question becomes, what's the point of this entire discussion? I mean, we get it. There was a ton of really miraculous stuff going on, right? Why do we need to have this whole debate about how many plagues there were, what was really going on? I mean, yeah, pestilence is pestilence. Darkness is darkness. So I think there's a very powerful idea over here. You know, a lot of times we we relate to a miracle as like this sum total event, right? Here's nature going the way that it does. And then there's like an interference that comes in in the middle. But what the Haggadah is talking about over here is the idea of compounded miracles. In other words, do you know how many things have to change within nature in order for a nace to actually take place, for a miracle to occur? I mean, it's not just the the changing of gravity, the changing of the, the, the seasons, right? The changing of the natural course of weather. There's going to be all sorts of, of organisms and life forces that need to be interfered with. Now, obviously, it's all the same as far as God goes. But when we're thinking about what it means for us, the attention to detail and the number of changes which would have to take place in order to express this supernatural event, the more we understand how many moving parts there are to it, the deeper our appreciation for the type of change which we're dealing with becomes. An additional idea which is true about these numbers is that each one of the extra plagues which takes place to the Egyptians is indicative of an, of an additional aspect of love for the Jewish people, a protection that was exhibited on behalf of the Jewish people. In other words, if we talk about 10 plagues and the 10 plagues falling upon the Egyptians instead of the Jews, okay, so there's 10 occurrences. But talk about 50, 100, 250 events, and each and every one of them became clearer and clearer to the Egyptians as well as to the nation of Israel that God was deliberately siding with Israel as opposed to the Egyptians and standing up for them and protecting them, there becomes a deeper experience of the love, of the care, the attention that the Almighty is providing to us. And perhaps one additional aspect about this is that we know that Hashem says that all that God guarantees the Jewish people that any of the calamities that were bestowed upon the Egyptians in Egypt, God guarantees he will not do to the Jewish people. 
And so to whatever extent we can discover more nuances of the, of the travesties and, and the, you know, the horrific plagues which took place in Egypt, we also understand more about what God is guaranteeing to the Jewish people as far as what he's uh, protecting us with um, from time immemorial and, and moving forward. So there's a tremendous amount of, of appreciation which is actually flowing through this discussion rather than just you know, the technicalities of what took place. We're looking for aspects of appreciation. And this really segues directly into the next paragraph of the Haggadah, which is the Song of Dayenu. And this is a beautiful prayer, a tribute of thanks and appreciation to God, listing through over a dozen different components of the redemption process of how we went from slaves to free people, and recognizing that each one of those moments, each landmark achievement uh, in the relationship between God and Israel was so remarkable, so momentous, so beyond our wildest expectations, that had we only experienced that moment alone, it would have been enough for us. It would have been so overwhelmingly uh, you know, intense of an experience, something that, that was so revolutionary for its time that it would be enough. And just to have been there at that moment would have been satisfactory. You know, when reading through some of these, a lot of times we can get stuck in, in, in thinking about this mechanically. And we can think about how the, each one of these was a step along the way to an ultimate culmination. And if that's the case, then some of these really don't seem to be enough. I mean, consider, imagine that God had, you know, split the sea, but didn't take us through. Would that have been enough? I mean, what's the point of splitting the sea if you're not going to save the Jewish people by bringing us through the sea? <laughs> you split the sea and then we all get murdered on the other side of the beach. I mean, it doesn't really help us too much. Or let's say he brought us to Har Sinai, but didn't give us the Torah. Would that have been enough? I mean, enough for what? I mean... <laughs> The whole point of going there is to get the Torah to enter into a love and covenant with God and so we can move on and live in the land of Israel with the ultimate freedom. If we don't get the Torah there, then what's really the point? Now, that way of thinking about these Dayenus won't serve you any good because the point isn't that if you had just given the, us that, it would have been enough to live on. It would have been enough to have the relationship with God based upon that. Obviously, you know, if you would have not given us the Torah, then we kind of would have been at a little bit of a standstill or if he hadn't taken us through the dry land and, you know, or drowned the Egyptians in the sea, it's not like that would have been sufficient as far as the end goal goes. But as far as recognizing the value of the stage itself, appreciating just the very fact that God stood up for us and he split the sea for us was such a momentous moment, such a moment of like being blown back in awe and gratitude that if I would have just been there for that moment, it would have been enough. Right? And we have moments like this in, in all of our lives. Moments where we feel like such a sense of closure, of wholesomeness, of feeling like I made it, I accomplished it. I'm at that moment, it could be a graduation or the birth of a child or something that's so momentous that you're sitting there in that moment, it's like, this is what life's about. Ah, like if only I would just have this moment and throughout my life, I'll end up thinking back to that moment and revisiting and relishing in that experience. And we think to ourselves, like, this is what it's all about. I mean, is this what it's all about? You just had the baby and then the whole world fell out of being? Would, would you be satisfied with that? Obviously not. You want to continue the story. And, you know, if, if the whole story came to an end at that point, it would be a, an insufferable loss. But as far as the value, the meaning, the eternality that is embedded within each one of those moments, we recognize it as being something so full that we feel like it's, it's just enough. It's enough to fill me, to make me feel whole and, and ultimately have everything that I could ever need. And so we sing through this and, and we say each one of these stages along the way would have been so much enough for us that we couldn't have even imagined how any more meaning could be added to our lives. And then we cap that off by saying, but you did keep providing more. That all the more so we have to be thankful because not only did you take us out of Egypt, but you led us through the desert and you split the sea and you took us through on dry land and you drowned our enemies in it. And then you provided food for us. You brought us to Mount Sinai and you gave us the Torah and you brought us into the land of Israel and you built us the base of Mikdash. And all of that was part of this process of bringing us into a place where we could address our mistakes, where we could own up to, to the tragedies and we could ultimately embrace freedom, embrace the relationship with God wholeheartedly and really throw ourselves into that experience. And so at that point, we become so overwhelmed with joy, with happiness, with celebration. We're realizing like, dear God, you've just been like pouring on the goodness on us that we're about to break into unfettered celebration and gratitude. And that's exactly what we're going to get to in the Haggadah in just a moment. But before we do that, Rabbi Gamliel will bring us 
a breaking news message telling us before we go on to celebrate and dive into the joyous uh, you know, occasion and uh, just praising God, we've got to remember a couple key components that we need to touch on before the Seder night can, uh, can continue and lead into the final stage. We'll have to see what Gamaliel has to teach us next time. Until then, I'm Chaim Davies, and this is the Chaim Davies Show.